When I was a kid, a couple blocks over, there was a, a standard house on the street with a single car garage door. And when it swung open, there before you was all kinds of model kits for sale. And at that time, some of the model kits were very little more than five blocks of wood and a three view drawing. My second or third kit was, was one of those because of course they were the cheapest ones. Here's a similar model. It's quite a bit more elaborate. Here's the fuselage. But here are the other parts which are actually stamped out of a piece of wood so that you could have their shape anyway to start with. And here are the plans yellowed with age. Now when I finished my first five blocks of wood and a set of plans, I took it to the big kids that lived behind us for a critique. The older big kid was pretty, pretty uh, tactful and said, well, it looks pretty good. The younger one, though, was a bit more of a, a, a critic. Now, soon it looked something like this, right? And he said, well, you know, an airplane is supposed to be you know, aluminum colored all right, but it should be shiny aluminum color. It shouldn't look like it has aluminum fur. I had used a lot of really coarse sandpaper to do my uh, shaping. And he said, you know, the airfoil, the wings are supposed to have an airfoil shape, and so are the tail. I had no idea what an airfoil shape was. And he said, you know, I think this is supposed to be a P-51 Mustang, so you got the wings on backwards. Well, after that, I had to reconsider. I didn't have the concept of research at the <clears throat> point that I was at in the middle of grade school as a C student, but I started looking into what was wrong. I asked my patient dad, and the, the patient civil engineer, and he told me that he had told me several times already you should use coarse sandpaper and then medium sandpaper and then fine sandpaper to get a good finish. And it would be even better if you painted the model with sanding sealer before you did that because that would fill in the holes and the cause of uh, the, the negative surfaces to also be filled. He also told me that plans were not just not very imaginative pictures of the airplane we're trying to build. They actually are trying to make a detailed picture of it that you can compare what you're building to to see if it looks the same which obviously it doesn't I also talked to many of my friends and also the school library during uh, free reading time and found that there were model magazines that told you all kind of things about airplanes that I never knew you could look at these things and look up stuff like lift, drag, gravity, thrust. You could also look up airfoil shapes and, and most of the plans that were shown in these magazines also showed a profile of the airfoil of the airplane you were supposed to be building, particularly if it was a flying model. I learned a lot of things there. I also considered the type of wood model I would build. The one I had tried would have been more appropriate for an experienced model builder. I had chosen it on the basis of cost alone. Wood solid kits were available almost completely formed with and with joining features already in place. Here are two examples of kits available throughout that time period. First are two Carver Craft kits. This is a Carver Craft SE5A World War I fighter kit you can see as a biplane it would be more difficult for a beginning builder, but the parts are all pretty much formed and just require a little sanding to refine them, except for the tail surfaces which need the airfoil shape to be uh, sanded into them. Here are the plans and instructions for the Carver Craft SE5A kit. Here are two Strombecker kits of that era. Strombecker had a wide variety of kits available. Here's a Strombecker model of the Douglas Skyrocket research aircraft. 
you can see that the fuselage is pretty well formed and it includes a place to insert the wings and these holes are drilled to give the appropriate dihedral which is pretty difficult when you're trying to butt joint a wing to the fuselage. You can see that the wings do have the beginning of an airfoil shape uh, sanded into them and you would have to complete that job. The tail surfaces are again square and you have to completely sand them to airfoil shape. Here are the plans and the beginning of the instructions for the Douglas Skyrocket kit. Here's a Strombecker kit of the B-24 World War II bomber. It's at the upper end of their size scale. There is a bigger kit, the B-29. Here's a major parts layout for the B-24 kit. You can see that almost everything is wood. In this packet is, is small parts, uh, wire uh, for landing gear struts, uh, uh, stamped metal propellers, uh, features of that nature. Uh, the kit even comes with a, a nose weight, considerable size, to fit into the fuselage so that the tricycle gear airplane will, will not sit on its tail. Since the completed model will be completely solid block of wood, any glazing or windows would have to be applied by decals, resulting in a pretty elaborate decal sheet. Strombecker was probably the most prolific maker of solid wood scale models. Here's a poor copy of their catalog from the middle of this time frame. In addition to Strombecker and uh, Carbocraft, there were quite a number of solid model uh, kit makers with ranging from very simplistic to pretty complex. There was Burkhart, Dynamodel Products, Comet. Comet made solid models early in this period but switched to built up and stick and t tissue models later. Carbocraft I, we've already seen Meyercraft, and Monogram. Over this time frame, scale modeling did evolve, or in modern terms, innovation did occur. Landing gear was always a problem. The smaller the scale, the harder it was to make a model that would stand up without breaking the gear. Aircraft that had retractable gear were sometimes provided with a stand to show them flying uh, and thus gear up. Most of the time there was no gear provided and plans gave a vague location of size and suggested you were on your own. Notice in this model the landing gear is shown, but when you see the picture of the completed and assembled model, no landing gear appears anywhere in the provided material. Here's a str small Strombecker kit of the F-80 that shows the, the model with no landing gear in the flying, so it's in the flying position held up by uh, the support of a stand which consisted of a piece of wood and a piece of wire. Intricate de details like radial engines, props, landing gear, and so forth were really hard to show. Here's our nacelle for the B-20 four made by Strombecker, and here is the best we can do for a radial engine in the front of it. Since models were well solid, there couldn't be any interior details shown. Glazing was also a problem. Sometimes folded paper was called for in the form of a bubble canopies, but it never worked for me. Here's a decal sheet from a Strombecker DC-6 kit. Notice that the the windows are all decals. A method of installing cockpits in single-engine fighter-type aircraft was invented during this period of time. There was a big cutout 
in the fuselage uh, provided, as you can see here, and as you built the aircraft and shaped it, you installed a thin piece of balsa wood uh, and formed it along with the rest of the fuselage to form the sides of the cockpit. Dynamodel was one of the more inventive of the, of the model makers at this time, and they incorporated this into their kit. As you can see here, this is a Spitfire kit. The kit also came with a an assembly jig. This is the only assembly jig I remember ever seeing. Uh, it's made out of cardboard. You, you cut it out and assemble it, and there, and it will hold the wings and the tail surfaces in the proper position relative to the fuselage when you glue them together. I understand that the head of Dynamodel was a Grumman engineer during World War II, so he was probably very familiar with assembly jigs. Well, what would you put in this in this cockpit? Dynamodel came with a box of beautifully cast metal parts. You might have an an armor plate uh, for the cockpit. How about a seat? There was also a control stick uh, instrument panel and in addition to that you got nicely formed propeller, uh, engine exhaust ports, uh, scoops, strong metal landing gear that had a nice flange at the top of them so they didn't poke all the way through the wing, more scoops, uh, oh. instrument panel with rudder pedals, more scoops, tail wheel, etc, etc. After you'd finished your aircraft uh, with its detailed cockpit, you need to cover that cockpit with something, and it would be nice if you could see inside. And that something was this vacuform plastic uh, canopy. Uh, this was a major innovation. In a very short period of time, almost every plastic model that, that in any way could use a vacuform canopy had one. Dynamodel was a major contributor to the advancement of solid models during this period of time with their cast uh, parts and their in improved design. Uh, but all this came at a price. It was probably the most expensive uh, manufacturer. Their lead was followed by Monogram. They produced smaller scale solid models with similar innovations but they came with detailed parts made out of another and different mater new material this was the new material of the age plastic here's a kit that somehow survived since my childhood in a, in a just barely started condition. Notice all these beautiful small cast details and of course the vacuform plastic canopy. At this point in time scale modeling was about to change drastically but that's a story for another time in another video.